All right. Hello, Nate. Thank you so much for joining us on the You Love and You Learn podcast. It's so great to be here with you, Sarah. It's awesome to connect again. We were just talking before this about how we originally connected through Instagram about three years ago when I was just starting off You Love and You Learn, and then you were just starting to begin writing the 8080 marriage, which is something that I look forward to talking to you more about today. Yeah, as we were saying, it's amazing to see how these ideas blossom over the years. Yeah. And I thought it would be interesting just to give a quick disclaimer because you use the word marriage and the concept we'll talk about is the 8080 marriage. But I think a lot of listeners and myself included are not yet married. But my interpretation, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that this, of course, applies to any relationship situation. It's more of just the general concept to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. We use the word marriage as the title. But you can easily substitute that for relationships. And it's actually interesting. We've even been exploring these concepts outside of intimate relationships Mm. at work, you know, relationships with friends, relationships with family members. Mm. All of these are, are relationships where some of these concepts can also be helpful and applicable. Absolutely. Great. Well, I have read up a little bit about what the 80-80 marriage dynamic is, of course, but can you explain to someone who maybe has never heard of what you're talking about, what you mean with this concept of 80-80? Yeah. Well, let's start with a couple different models of marriage. Um, And really what inspired us to write this book is that we, my wife and I realized we were subconsciously adopting our parents' model of marriage which was totally not designed for our circumstance and our values. And so so we started looking at, well, what are the different models? And one place to start is with what we call the 80-20 model. And this is, you know, go back to 1950s, think of your grandparents or great-grandparents. The basic model here is one partner, generally the woman, is responsible for 80% of contribution, both to the house, but also to the relationship. And the other partner, generally the man, gets away with 20%, right? Mm -hmm. And this model, I think, luckily, over the last 70 years has been supplanted by a new model and a new way of thinking where in virtually every modern couple today, the assumption is we are equals going into marriage. And so we call this this new model that sort of evolved the 50-50 model. And the basic idea there is that We are equals. So how do we stay equals and in love? Well, let's try to make everything perfectly 50-50 fair. Mm -hmm. And not only that, we're going to keep an elaborate mental scorecard of all of our contributions, constantly comparing them against each other. And once we achieve this elusive goal of fairness, we're going to somehow ascend into the heavens of marital bliss or relationship bliss, and everything's going to be awesome. Great sex, never going to fight, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So so that's all just the backdrop here, because as probably everybody listening to this knows, and certainly this was true of my wife and I, that striving for fairness, that model of trying to keep score actually leads to the opposite of its intended goal. Mm-hmm. It leads to more conflict, more tension, et cetera. Yeah. So basically the, the 80-80 model is in essence a response to that historical backdrop. And the idea is, if we really want to break free from this trap of 50-50 fairness, we have to do something radical. And that radical thing is a mindset shift from fairness to what we call radical generosity. The idea of of striving to do more than your fair share, 80%. And we know the math doesn't work. There's no such thing as 160% whole, but the idea is that by, by striving for something like 80%, we're not going to hit it, but we're going to fundamentally change the underlying dynamics of the relationship. Mm, Yeah, that's so important. And I'll be the first to admit, like I can absolutely work on that internal scorecard. And it's something I have been working on in my own relationship. And I feel like it's been also called like that tit for tat mentality of like, okay, well, if you do this, then I need to do this. Or because I did this, I expect you to do this. Can you talk a little bit more about that, you know, that shift into more of that 50-50 dynamic with the fairness piece? Why do you think that for many people that can be such a strong 
you know, point in their relationship of needing that fairness and like where, you know, that kind of um, like, if it's unfair, if I don't get this, like how that can bring up more tension in the situation. Absolutely. Fairness is a noble goal. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to put down fairness. And I also want to make clear that it's a huge improvement over the gender inequalities of the past. Mm -hmm. It's also like radically new. I mean, if you think about just the, the sociology of what's happened over the last 70 years, we are in some ways the first generation that's trying to figure out this whole egalitarian equal marriage thing. Mm. So we really don't have a model. I mean, that's part of why we wrote the book. So I, I think it's a noble aspiration, but in practice, it often leads to failure and conflict. And there's some interesting reasons for that that come from research and psychology. Because one of the things we wanted to understand is like, intuitively, we knew this wasn't working, but why isn't it working? What are yeah. the dynamics that are making this so problematic? And there are really two cognitive biases that are underlying these assessments of fairness that make it almost impossible to judge what is or isn't fair in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So one of them is what psychologists call availability bias which is basically just a fancy way of saying that all of my wonderful contributions in my relationship, you know, all of my trips to the store, trips to take the kid to school, all of that is available to me. I see it happening in real time. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to what my wife Kaylee is doing, most of what she's doing happens without me even seeing it, right? It happens, you know, sort of outside of my awareness. So the result is that I tend to systematically underestimate her contributions. Mm, yeah. As if that weren't bad enough, there's another cognitive bias, which is the overestimation bias. They've done all these studies of household work and daycare, and they found that all of us, but particularly men, tend to vastly overestimate the amount of time we put into household work. Mm. So what that means is, you know, I say I spent an hour and a half helping our kid with the math homework or whatever. And it was probably more like an hour, maybe more mm -hmm. like 45 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. So so you think about those two together. I'm systematically overestimating what I do. I'm systematically underestimating what my partner does. Mm -hmm. And now we're having these scorekeeping conversations about what is or isn't fair. And you can see why the whole system is a setup, right? It's designed to fail. Like there, there's no way that this can work. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's why we think that, that it's really worth exploring alternatives to that model. Yeah, that's so interesting. And both of those, I can resonate with my own examples in my relationships and I'm sure anyone listening can. And I think, you know, gender aside, even though that is such a big factor, it's like in any dynamic, there's just these expectations that we place and each partner probably, I don't know if you found this a lot in the work that you've done with your own clients or just hearing from people that their definition of fair might also be slightly different from the person that they're in relationship with. And so what I define as fair and what my partner might define as fair, that also is different. And so I just think it's understanding where each person is coming from and people are wanting to feel seen and heard for what they're contributing and yeah. both partners are wanting that. But trying to get on the exact same page about what is exactly fair. It's really hard to do because we're so unique. Well, what you're pointing to there, Sarah, I think is really important, which is that it's not just that we're overestimating what we're doing that makes this problematic. It's that there's so many different domains of contribution happening simultaneously mm -hmm. that our definitions of fairness are different, right? So I might have spent an entire day doing the family finances and feel like it's unfair that my wife is out with her friends getting a massage, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm only comparing the domain of family finances against what she's doing in that moment. And I might be excluding all sorts of other things. She might've been up all night with the kids. Mm -hmm. She might've done all sorts of shopping for the family the day before, right? But But that's just another trap here is that we tend to compare like what we do in one specific domain against what our partner's doing in that same domain, mm. thereby excluding all the other things that they're doing. Yeah. So again, it just, it shows that like this model of scorekeeping and this model of fairness, it's, it's sort of designed 
to create conflict, to create resentment. And that's not what we want. That's not why we're in relationship. We want connection. You know, we want love, all these other things. So, so that's the big idea is we need to figure out how to make that shift. Mm, Yeah. This, this conversation comes at an interesting time. I was just talking in my group coaching program recently about like how much compromise is too much compromise versus Mm. like, you know, kind of sticking to your own like guns as far as what you need from a relationship or a person. But then also, of course, knowing that in many successful relationships, there is this balance of compromise. And I think that in my audience, especially when people are experiencing some level of anxiety around a relationship, those lines can get really blurry because you hear these all or nothing type, you know, social media posts that's like, oh, my partner Mm. does everything. Like they do all of the chores. They do this and that. And I don't have to lift a finger, like so happy to be with this person. And you can kind of get this sense that there is this perfect partner that will just meet all of your needs perfectly. And I, that's not my experience. Um, But then you also have these other extreme situations where someone is overly giving and they're the one that feels like they're giving, 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 and that other person is not actually contributing anything. And so I think there can be these extremes on either end we think that we're either giving way too much and our partner's not doing anything uh or we think that we should be just receiving 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 from this person and how do you how does someone know what that right balance is for them and i know the 80 80 model is obviously partly the answer for you of like each person should be showing up as much as they can with that radical generosity but how does someone assess if they're in a relationship where they can find that happy medium and where everyone involved is willing to kind of roll up their sleeves and participate in the 80, 80 model? Yeah, there's so much there. I love that question. I think the first thing to say is that you're absolutely right with anything, any virtue, generosity, setting good, healthy boundaries, you can either underdo it or overdo it. Mm-hmm. Right. So the reason we didn't call this the hundred, a hundred marriage that you should like give a hundred percent of yourself to your marriage is that we do think it's possible to overdo generosity, to go so far that you lose yourself. Yeah. You know, you lose your voice in the relationship. That said, what you're pointing out as well is that it's possible to overdo boundaries. Mm-hmm. And I think we live in a culture now where the background ethos is this ethos of individual success, looking out for yourself. And so like, I think as a culture, there's this tendency to sort of look out for our own needs first Mm -hmm. to the detriment of being in a relationship. So, so, I mean, like, you know, you can overdo or underdo and, and that's where there's no mathematical formula here it's complicated, right? And and it requires a lot of discretion and, and sometimes coaching and, and self-reflection and that sort of thing. But the other thing that I would say is that there are certainly instances where people find themselves in a relationship that is radically unfair mm-hmm. and something needs to be done about that. What I would say to that situation is that often when we find ourselves in that place where we're over-contributing, we have a partner who's under-contributing, we don't use the most skillful means to navigate that situation, right? Mm-hmm. So, so often the default strategy is either to nag the other person to be like, you don't do enough, you know, how I'm doing everything, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like that's one strategy, mm-hmm. or maybe there's a strategy of withdraw, just like withdrawing intimacy, withdrawing from your partner, withdrawing mm-hmm. connection, yeah. You know, and, and hoping they're going to contribute more. The problem with those kinds of strategies is that they lead to the very opposite of the intended outcome. Mm. Right. So, you know, you you nag your partner. Is that really going to make them want to do more? No, it's going to make them want to do less. Right. So you're you're actually creating this this feedback loop. So so in those situations, you know, it's it's a matter of finding alternative tools. So one of those could be doing what you're already doing from this place of generosity instead of resentment that can often totally change the atmosphere. But another might be having that conversation from a place of love that says, hey, I love you. I want to be with you. And this isn't working for me. And Mm -hmm. I want to figure out together how we make this work. 
That's so different than you don't do enough. I do everything, <laughs> right? Can you feel the difference in just yeah. like the energetic quality of those two? Yeah, absolutely. That's such a good point. I There was a podcast that I was listening to a while ago of Glennon Doyle's where she was talking about the invisible load. Um, and I've heard the phrase before, but they explained it so well that a lot of people feel like they're carrying the invisible load of doing all these things. And maybe one partner will say, well, how can I help? But the person asking, how can I help? Even though their intentions are pure, if one partner feels like they're the one delegating all the time, they have this invisible load because they're the one kind of managing yeah. all of those things. And I, I'm sensing some of that coming up in what you just said, which is if one person maybe feels like they're over contributing, then there needs to be this honest and open discussion that's like, hey, let's come up with a solution together. I feel like I have this invisible load and maybe you don't realize that, but let's work together us versus the problem instead of me versus you type mentality. Exactly. And I, I think that if we just zoom out to 40,000 feet here on relationships, the big move here that we're talking about is the move from everything just happening by accident, mm. which is what usually happens in relationships, right? Like if you look at who's doing what, your division of roles, your division of labor, the division of the mental load or emotional labor as it's often called, it usually happens by accident Yeah, that we never really like intentionally decide it. And we just allow random historical accident and maybe 1950s gender roles decide who does what. Mm -hmm. And so, so the big shift here is really to, well, what if we were to create a more intentional structure? So, you know, in our work and in the book, we talk a lot about mindset, but we also talk about this idea of structure, of intentional design. Mm. And around something like roles, I think the real opportunity that a lot of couples have is to take that step back and say like, wow, somehow... We landed in this crazy arrangement where like one of us is doing everything. The other person's not really doing much at all. That's, mm -hmm. that's wild. Obviously that's not going to work very well. So what if we were to just like design this in a more ideal way? You know, what if we viewed this almost like a business and like, we're both good at different things. We both like doing different things. How do we want to create a life together? Yeah. And, and that is just a radical, huge shift if you can make it. Absolutely. What are some questions? Like, let's say someone's listening and they want to sit down and initiate that conversation with their partner um, from a kind place of like, hey, I mm. realize things are feeling like this. I want to get your thoughts on it. What are some questions that maybe they can ask to start, you know, prompting ideas of how they want to show up more intentionally and kind of like co-creating an experience that is working better for everyone involved? I think the best question to ask, it's super simple, but it's actually a pretty radical shift. We tend to ask the question, not out loud, but in our own minds constantly, what's best for me? Is this best for me? Is this arrangement best for me? Is this job best for me? You know, <laughs> that, that's the question we subconsciously ask ourselves hundreds of times a day. And so the, I think the, the game-changing question is to sit down together and ask what's best for us. Mm. And we even encourage couples to go one step further to instead of us to think of like, if you were to come up with a name for your relationship, your family, in our case, it's Kajona, K-A for Kaylee, N-A for Nate, J-O for Jory. Mm. Um, that's my daughter. So the, the question is, you know, what's best for Kajona or what's best for us? And that's a question that can be applied to every domain of your life together. Mm. What's best for us in terms of that next professional decision? Mm -hmm. What's best for us in terms of the, um, you know, the arrangement of roles together? What's best for us in terms of this big spending decision we're thinking about, you know, buying a house, buying a car, et cetera. Mm. I think that question just fundamentally reorients the conversation. Yeah. So that would be my recommendation. Instead of giving you like 10 different questions, which nobody's going to yeah. remember, I, I like to stick to something really simple, just yeah. what's best for us. Yeah. And that I had a note here that you had written something um, in a, a recent post saying that 
by trying to make everything exactly fair, we've lost sight of one of the most essential aspects of marriage or a relationship, which is the shared success. And I yeah. think that is kind of what you're speaking to now, which is like the the collective or like the we and the us versus the me, mm-hmm. me, me. And I, it's so hard, I think, to get out of that mindset because of all the messaging we've gotten that is lately saying, well, make sure that you focus on you. And mm-hmm. if, yeah, like if you're not happy, then no one else can be, which I agree with all of that. It's like holding two different ideas at once. You have to take care of yourself so you can take care of other things in your life but there can be like we said earlier a place where it goes so far that you're only focused on you and not the other aspects yeah what you know an example could be helpful here because we've been talking about this in the abstract in a conceptual way but kaylee and i for the first 10 years of our marriage we're now at 18 years i think Mm -hmm. um for the first decade or so we were in that kind of turf war mentality, what's best for me, trying to make sure the other person didn't impinge on our our turf, as it were. Mm-hmm. And it really came to a head when we had a child. And this is what we found is that often in relationships, the moment where things sort of drop down to another level of conflict is when a kid enters the picture. And all of a sudden, like, you really do have to think about what's best for the two of you. It's almost impossible to run two separate programs and two separate realities. And for us, there was this moment where our daughter was about six years old. She was about to go to elementary school. And the question was, who's going to meet her at the bus at 315? Mm -hmm. And what was best for me was to do the work that I needed to do till five or six. And what was best for Kaylee, my wife, was to do her work and travel for her job and all the stuff that she did. And we were really at an impasse. Like it was an impossible problem to solve. And then when we took that step back and we said, well, what's best for us? You know, what's best for us is to have one of us be there for our daughter when she gets off that bus. Mm -hmm. Like that's just, that's inarguable. Yeah. And so for me, that was this moment where I said, you know, I think I can make it work to go down to 80% at my work. I was working at a startup at the time that I created and it was kind of crazy. And people at work were like, why are you doing this? This is crazy. But it it actually was one of the best decisions we ever made. And and again, it was a a problem that was impossible to solve Mm -hmm. from that mindset of what's best for me. It had to be solved through shared success. Mm, yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks for bringing that example into it. Cause I think it's, yeah. yeah, sometimes people can be like, well, how does that apply? Yeah. I I'm thinking in my own relationship and, you know, Nate and I are in Sweden for his job. And at the time, I mean, I was so excited to be living in a new country, but of course it was giving up some things mm. that I would be more familiar with at home. And I wasn't sure like how it would all turn out. And I think at that time, what was kind of best for the we or the us was to make that move so he could Mm. get this job opportunity here. But now as we're recording this, we're both, you know, in, we're almost two and a half years into being here. And we're, I, at least I can only speak for myself and slowly just being like, okay, I'm starting to miss my family. I'm starting to miss my friends. And we don't have any plans yet to actually, you know, leave and we don't want to leave necessarily here, but we are starting. Okay. Like I'm missing home a little bit. I've at least instigated some of that. And I think at that point, because I was able to think about the, we two years, two or so years ago, I think Nate is now more perceptive to the, we from my you know side mm. of things. And that's another example where it might not be exactly what you envision originally, but you can kind of trust that if you make a radical generosity move at one point, then you're not expecting it to come back to you, but it can naturally just unfold that way because of what you already did without expectation originally. I love that example because what you're pointing to is this underlying principle of mindset. And the way I would put it is our mindset and relationship is contagious. Mm. So if you were viewing that move and that whole situation from the mindset of fairness, I would guess that Nate would respond in kind, that it would be contagious, that mm-hmm. you know, if you had spent the last two and a half years 
living in resentment, you know, how could I move here for you? And I do everything for you. Mm-hmm. He would probably mirror that back to you. That's yep. just the way the mind works, right? It, it's um, this, this phenomenon called complementary behavior in psychology. Mm-hmm. So by shifting your mindset, in this case, to that mindset of what's best for us, what's shared success look like, it's almost like the, your partner can now step into that same mindset. It's contagious. Yeah. And as you mentioned, like it might not happen like cause and effect style right in the moment. You know, you say, yes, I'll move to Sweden. And all of a sudden he regales you with flowers or something like that. <laughs> but like over the long arc of the relationship, you're creating this upward spiral mm. simply by shifting your mindset. I mean, and that's like the the radical power of this this whole idea is that, you know, even if even if it doesn't seem like you know, even if it seems irrational or scary or uncomfortable, like there's just this trust that you can have that like this, this is going to, to reshape our dynamic and the culture of our relationship. Yeah. Um, And you'll start to see that, I think, you know, as you move deeper into the mindset. Yeah. And what my perspective is, I'd be curious to hear if you agree is like, there's no harm in trying because if you try and you still don't notice any shift in the relationship after intentionally sitting down and, you know, trying it, or even just trying it on your end and there's nothing that changes, then that's when you can be like, okay, well, maybe I'm noticing now kind of like the, the pattern yeah. here. And you can kind of question if that feels helpful for the greater good in your life but if you are going to try the 80 80 approach and then you do see the benefits from it then it can really just help you move forward and build momentum so to me it just feels like there's no reason not to try it totally i I mean really i think of it as there's like a few different options option one if you're feeling really stuck in a relationship is to just keep doing what you're doing Mm-hmm. And you can pretty much predict what the results are going to be. They're going to be exactly what you're getting right now. Yep. So, and that's totally fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with staying there. Option two is you try shifting to this shared success, radical generosity mindset. And maybe your partner responds in a way that that's really interesting. And, and there's this kind of contagious effect. And mm-hmm. it actually starts to really change the underlying dynamics of the relationship. Or maybe you make this shift and your partner doesn't respond, but at least in that third option, you're not living with as much resentment. You're not carrying as much anger with you. And so so based on those three options, I mean, for me, I think it's a no-brainer. It's worth trying because like, you know, the status quo option isn't that great. It's not really serving anybody. Yeah. Yeah. So status quo, meaning like one person is resentful that they feel like there's exactly. an contribution and an under contribution happening. Yeah. Yeah. So how does someone, you know, I think part of it is a mindset shift. So I want to acknowledge yeah. that part of it is a little bit more intangible, but do you have any recommendations if someone's listening to this and they're saying, okay, I think I do want to shift into a little bit more of that radical generous approach, or I want to show up in that 80% way as kind of a gift to the overall good of my relationship and myself. What are some small things that they can do to start actually implementing that? Or even just one is fine. Yeah, there are a few different things that can be really powerful. So one really practical tool is contribution. Mm -hmm. And When we talk about contribution, I think there's this tendency to think about these huge, lavish acts of contribution, you know, um, scheduling a trip to Fiji with your partner, going to like their favorite band's concert with backstage passes, whatever, right? Like, and, and that's fine. Do that. You know, that'd be really fun. But we think of contribution, some of the most powerful forms of it happening in a smaller but more regular cadence. So mm-hmm. things like making your partner coffee in the morning, or mm-hmm. maybe putting a sticky note on their monitor that says, I love you, or, you know, uh, giving them a neck rub, whatever it is, right? Like it can be just a really small thing that only takes a minute or two to do. Yeah. But again, you're kind of like initiating that upward spiral effect by doing that. So that's one. The second key element of radical generosity is appreciation. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I almost think of it like there's a call and response between contribution and appreciation that 
contribution is is this amazing act. Appreciation is the the recognition of that act. Mm-hmm. And a lot of couples get in the trap of seeing essentially the opposite of appreciation. Mm-hmm. So seeing everything through the lens of criticism and essentially seeing what's wrong. Yeah. And and appreciation I think of as like flipping those glasses on their head and starting to look for how is my partner actually contributing? Mm-hmm. And and it can be helpful here to almost ritualize this and turn it into a, a regular habit. Yeah. <clears throat> so in our relationship, we try every night before we go to sleep to just express one appreciation for each other. It takes about a minute, 30 seconds. It's yes. not a big deal. But it's so powerful just to be seen and to to create a kind of regular habit where you're you're feeling that every day. That also has this pretty powerful upward spiral effect. Yeah, I love that. And I once heard advice, I forget who it was, but just saying thank you for the simplest things that should be quote, quote, expected. And there's this social media narrative now of like, don't just say thank you for the bare minimum or like, don't Mm. like celebrate the bare minimum. But I do think that in a relationship, those little mundane things that you do, like taking out the trash or cooking dinner for that night, if you don't get in that spirit of appreciation, then it's when you start taking those things for granted and maybe your partner doesn't feel seen. Um, And that availability bias, I think probably then becomes extra magnified because even the stuff that they're doing when you don't see it, they're like, well, they never see that. And then now the stuff they do Mm -hmm. see, they're not appreciating. (laughs) So I think it can be kind of like this downward spiral almost as opposed to that upward one where you're creating the uh, appreciation. Well, and there's some really interesting science behind all of this. Um, John Gottman, who many of your listeners may have heard of, he's like the leading scientific researcher on marriage. He claims to predict with 94% accuracy whether a couple will get divorced or not after like 10 minutes of watching them talk. Mm -hmm. And you might say, wow, that's crazy. But the way he does it is actually very simple he's discovered that there's this sort of magic ratio in relationships, which is a ratio between your positive and negative interactions Mm -hmm. with one another. So what he finds is that if a couple has five positive interactions for every one negative interaction, Mm -hmm. so, you know, five appreciations for every one criticism, Mm -hmm. they're a thriving couple. They're likely going to make it. Mm -hmm. As that ratio goes down though, And this is something a lot of couples experience where it's just easier to focus on the negative Mm -hmm. and it's easier to get stuck in those loops of criticism. That's one of the things, probably the most important thing that starts to undermine the health of a relationship Mm. is when like the whole dynamic and the whole conversation starts to be about those negative things and starts to revolve around criticism instead of appreciation. Yeah. And I do think a lot of this is just a practice, you know, like an inner practice and an outer practice, both internally, like the cognitive bias or yeah, confirmation bias, sorry, of like, what are you looking for? So are you looking to confirm what's wrong and what's missing? Or are you looking to confirm what's right and what's going well? And it's a practice to look for that, especially for the anxious mind. And so I'm aware of that from my own experience, but I do think Mm. the practice is worth it. And Brene Brown always says that uh, gratitude is not an attitude. It's a practice because I think that can be like when you say, oh, well, I just don't have a grateful attitude. I'm just not that type of person. Then it kind of gives you a cop out from actually needing to put that energy towards practicing being more grateful. So I think some of these Mm -hmm. things are an internal practice looking for more of that and an external practice of actually setting up a cadence to share these things and maybe making it a point, like every day I'm going to have an alarm that I'm going to share something kind with my partner. And it sounds so unsexy, but if you're not used to doing it, you're going to have to practice in some sort of way. Yeah. I love that Brene Brown point that Mm -hmm. it's a practice. And I would apply that to relationships Yes, because I think that for whatever reason, we seem to think that relationships should be easy that they don't require much work and they should just sort of like go on autopilot. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where we all got that belief, but it's definitely not true. And I think we all know that it's not true. Yeah. 
And yet there's this part of us that resists the idea that, oh, you actually have to practice relationship yeah, and practice marriage. And what's weird is like, you know, when it comes to things like leadership or uh, stress or physical fitness, we all know that you can't just like instantly get fit. You're not mm -hmm. like fit by nature. You have to go out and run or swim mm -hmm. or whatever. Same mm -hmm. with leadership. You're not just like born an amazing leader. You have to learn how to do it. You have to read good books on it. Look at the mm -hmm. best systems. And, and so it's just strange that when it comes to relationships, there's this belief out there that you shouldn't have to read a book on it. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to work on it. It should yeah. just be easy. And that's where it comes back to your point at the beginning of our conversation that a lot of people will then think, well, that I have the wrong partner because this is mm -hmm. hard. Yeah. And I think as long as you have that belief, you're probably never going to have a lasting relationship because it's always hard. Even with the perfect partner, like the best ideal match you could find, you're going to have hard weeks, maybe even hard years, maybe even hard decades together. Yeah. Right. But it's kind of like how you navigate those rough patches that's going to define you as a couple. So, yeah. so anyway, all that's to say, like, it's a practice. It's totally a practice. And I know that feels weird and it's strange and it shouldn't be a practice. And, you know, we should just be madly in love all the time without having to work at it. But like, that's just not reality. Yeah. And I, I've been really thinking about resistance a lot lately and how, you know, it's just, when it's something that's so meaningful and important to us, but we're still resisting it, it's like that's when we know that there's something internal going on because we say we have <laughs> the relationship we've always dreamed of in some yeah. senses, but then we question if it's actually right. Or we say we really want to start that side hustle, but then we just keep procrastinating and whatever it is. It's like there's these big dreams that we know are meaningful in some sort of way, but we always find a reason why it's not good enough. And so that's a sign that... Yeah there's some inner excavation probably of some outdated beliefs or, you know, outdated patterns from our past, or maybe it is our caretakers past or whatever that have just been subconsciously passed down. And that's why I'm just so excited about the work that so many people are doing in the relationship space lately, because it's bringing these new permission slips for people that make them feel less guilty if things do feel challenging. Yeah, well, I mean, that's where I really appreciate the work that you're doing, because I think in many ways, our relationships are really just this perfect opportunity to understand ourselves better. Yes. And we tend to pick unconsciously a partner who both brings out the best in us, but also unearths some of the more painful sides of our, our self yeah. that we have to face in a relationship. Yeah. And so, you know, you could view that as a problem or you could view that as the ultimate opportunity of being in a relationship that this other person is going to help you face and understand and learn how to work with the most difficult parts of yourself. Yeah. That's what they're there for in a way, you know, and it's kind of weird to say, but, but that's where, you know, if the mindset is like, oh, this is hard, this is painful. I don't want to feel this. I must be with the wrong person. That sometimes is true, you know, in cases of of manipulation and and you know uh, violence and and yeah. you know really extreme cases. Yes, that's totally true. Um, but often it's just another sort of form of internal resistance that's keeping us from facing some of those things that are deep down that that really can be seen and and can be worked through and and can be understood. Yeah. And I feel like the shared success phrase that you have, which I love, I think mm. that if we're looking at our relationship as a chance to grow both individually and collectively, then yeah. instead of the hardships being like, oh, well, this is a sign I'm with the wrong person. It's a sign. Okay, well, then how can we just continue to build more sh shared success? And as long as like both people are in some senses willing to create that shared success yeah. together, then great. And if you continue to try and move towards that shared success and you're not getting, you know, any sort of response, then you can at least say you tried. But I think a lot of people yeah. are just kind of expecting the shared success to happen without putting in the legwork to get there. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. And I think, yeah, that is, that's the whole journey. And there is a lot of discretion because I don't want to make it sound like 
you're always in the perfect relationship. You know, there are certainly instances where the match isn't quite right or the dynamic is such that it's just going to be very difficult to make it work. Mm. So those, those exist. And I don't want to like make it sound mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, every relationship is, is the perfect relationship. Yeah. So, so it's complicated, but, but I think there is like this discretion that you can have to see the difference between being in a really unhealthy relationship with the wrong person and being in a perfectly healthy relationship where you're just sort of experiencing that natural anxiety about maybe I'm with the wrong person. Maybe this isn't right. You know, and, and it's, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes, but I think if you really sit with it and slow things down, you can start to discern that. Yep. And I think that brings up a great point that in response to what you're saying, you know, a lot of people can try to rush that choice or I need to know right now if this is right. And I need to predict with guarantees that it's going to be right versus to your point, slowing down, you know, for example, while we're talking about the 8080 model, I'll just weave it in again, like using the 8080 model, trying to contribute and appreciate Mm -hmm. more and seeing what comes up, just being curious about that. And trusting that eventually it will become more clear because I know that the anxious mind wants to know today right now, but I've found that through more time, I've realized that, you know, I have been in a situation where there is contribution on both sides. And like, we do want that shared success together, but it becomes more apparent. I think if that isn't the case. Well, and I love that you spend a lot of time talking about anxiety because I think that's a that's a big deal right now in our modern world. And it's a big deal in relationships. And one of the things I like to think about with anxiety is like, as you said, there's this, there's this desire, this instinct to try to make everything understandable and reduce it down into a simple solution and and control everything. And in a relationship, I mean, even just the relationship with your own mind, it's really difficult to control everything yep. because, mm-hmm. because you're, you're talking about a really complicated relationship that's both about logistics and how you live together, but also love and sex and all these different things. I mean, it's really wild, the number of variables that are, that are in this. Yeah. And so there's a sense in which I think the, the key is to really like become comfortable with the discomfort that naturally arises when we move into the unknown. Yeah. You know, both both in terms of staying with our own emotions, but also being with a partner who could leave at any moment, mm-hmm. who could cheat on us, right? Like that is all totally possible. Mm-hmm. And so it, it requires this, just this ability to kind of find comfort and discomfort, which I know is a weird concept, but in, in mindfulness, which is one of the traditions I, I work in a lot, Uh, That's one of the central ideas is instead of trying to find that place where we live in happy land and everything's great. And, you know, our life looks like our Instagram feed to, to sort of like actually find the opposite, (laughs) you know, to, to find like a a certain comfort in the brokenheartedness and the anxiety and the, all the things that we experience as human beings. Yeah. Just like this baseline acceptance of what is versus what should be or what's supposed to be and what we have visions of and being just at peace. And it's really hard. I'm making it sound easier than it is, but like being at peace with what is going on and not trying to change something without first acknowledging that this is where I'm at first now and I can move forward from here, but I don't need to always be (laughs) moving forward. So yeah, and it's it's so tricky. The mind is so slippery because the mind will even like use acceptance as a tool to feel good again. You know, mm-hmm. like I mean, like oh, if I end. just accept my anxiety, then it'll go away and I'll feel awesome and relaxed and blissed out. You know, and like, and that's not it. You know, that's you're still you're sort of using acceptance then to manipulate your inner state, and and. Yeah. So, so the, it's a really tricky practice, but oh, yeah. I think, you know, if you can start to sort of move into that space again, as an individual, but also in a relationship, because, you know, I, I talked to this marriage therapist the other day and he said, everyone in a relationship is excited and happy to go second. What he meant by that is like, 
everybody's excited to respond once their partner does the nice thing mm. or once their partner initiates the hard conversation. Mm. But most people don't want to go first. Yeah. They don't want to put themselves out there because it's uncomfortable and you don't know whether your your partner will respond and it's scary. And and I I think that's all right, but it also feels like, you know, that edge of your comfort zone is really the place where growth can start to happen in your relationship. I mean, that's where the magic happens. So if you start to feel that discomfort, the anxiety, some of the fear, instead of thinking like, oh, that's a sign that I'm with the wrong person, it might actually be, that's a sign that we're moving in the right direction, that, that growth is about to happen. Connection is about to happen. Yeah. So good. Now that you brought it up, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this. Like what, how do you shift out of, and I mean, again, it's not just like this easy cookie cutter answer, but how do you shift out of acceptance as a means to an end to feel better versus more acceptance in that mindfulness practice you talk about, which is actually just getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Do you have any insight mm. as to that balance? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really tricky. I would say for me, I'll just give you my, the tools that I use. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've spent a long time meditating, cultivating various mindfulness practices. Mm -hmm. And I find that a regular meditation practice for me is really key for that. Mm -hmm. Because when I have to sit with my mind for long enough, there comes a point where like, I can see all those clever strategies that are happening mm -hmm. and I can just kind of like let that go mm -hmm. and just relax into whatever is happening. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, meditation is powerful. The other thing that I think can be powerful is I think we're more apt to do that when we're in that kind of like stressed out, amped up nervous system mode. Yeah. So another thing that's really powerful for acceptance and allowing is really engaging in any sort of practice that, that allows us to dial down the nervous system. Yeah. So yoga is a great practice. Yoga Nidra, another amazing practice. Um, even breathing, extended exhale breathing, where you're, you're sort of like shifting the underlying biology that puts that controlling mind into motion such that you, you can relax enough to actually allow and actually accept. So I think like anybody who's been in that, like really revved up fight or flight, anxious state knows that like, it's just really hard in that state to do it. It's not impossible, yeah. but it's way easier if you can kind of like dial it down a little bit and yep. shift the underlying biological processes such that you're able to relax and let go a little bit. Yeah. And I found that it helps just to also like both of those things are so important, but I also have proactively tried to remind myself mm. as often as possible that like, I'm expecting things to always feel comfortable because that's, yeah. you know, I'm trying to have everything be great and protect myself from the uncom yeah. uncomfortable emotions, but that isn't real. Like it's, I just have to keep like reminding myself that that's a cognitive distortion to try and expect everything yeah. to be comfortable all the time. And so when I just can at least like change my belief system to yep. not expect that, then I find that it sometimes becomes, it's not again, easy, but just a little bit easier in that moment to not react, but to rather respond. Yeah. I love that. And, um, you know, it reminds me another practice I've been working with lately is around asking for help. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's two dimensions to that one is you know, asking for help from friends or therapist or a group, like the kinds of groups you lead. But the other is for me, almost more mystical, like just asking life, God, whatever for help. Yeah. It feels so scary, especially for me. I don't know why, maybe that's just my, my wiring, mm -hmm. but it, you know, it feels like I shouldn't have to ask for help. I should understand how all of this works. I, you know, I've been meditating every day for 15 years. Like I should have this down. Mm -hmm. And, it, and, but there's something about that move that it allows me to just like sort of come to terms with the fact that, that there is so much that I do not control. 
Yeah. And, and it's almost like a surrendering of my will to something else, whatever that is. I don't know what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but that can be a really powerful move because anxiety, I think has so much to do with control, you know, like we're trying to control reality, like trying to control situations and relationships and, you know, even global events like the war in Ukraine, like, you know, we're, we're trying to control the, the outcome of the next presidential election. Like it's, it's crazy what we're trying to do in our minds. And yeah. so anything you can do that allows you to just sort of see that so much of this is just happening. Yeah. It kind of like creates that, that invitation. Yeah. I love that. I love both topics. We kind of got into more on like the relationship <laughs> side and then more on that yeah. internal side. Cause I think that's so important in any totally person's dynamic, whether you're in a relationship or not, it's like, there are those ingredients of how you show up and try to either release control or control. And then also how that plays out in the relationship. So I have a couple of final questions, but before then, is there anything else you want to share either about the 80-80 model or about mindfulness that's coming up for you? No, I would just, I would go back to your point about Brene Brown, mm -hmm. that all of this is a practice Yes, and it's an imperfect practice. And I think that's important to remember because at least my experience living in this modern world when I go on Instagram or a place like that, I can start to think that, you know, I should have all of this figured out. This should be easy. I shouldn't be struggling. Look at all these people who seem to be living such amazing lives. Mm -hmm. And I, I think just like remembering that that's not real and, and that, you know, there is a path here that, that can lead to a better relationship or, you know, even just a, a different way of identifying with your own mind and things like anxiety, but it's not a linear path where yeah. like one day you wake up and you're like, yeah, I don't feel anxiety or one way you wake up and like, oh, we finally reached the perfect relationship. And, you know, mm -hmm. we're just going to coast here for the rest of our life like that, even though that seems to be presented to us by our culture as the outcome we want to get to, I just don't believe that that exists. Mm -hmm. I think it's, we're, we're always in this in this kind of ex exploration, I guess, and to just embrace the magic of that instead of trying to reach the end point where we're done. Yeah, I love that. I love the exploration, uh, the essence of exploration, just staying open <laughs> to it. So yeah. the final question um, that I ask everybody, because this is the You Love and You Learn podcast, is there mm. anything that you want to leave listeners with that you have learned about love, kind of like one tidbit that you've really learned about love in your experience? I think what I've learned through my relationship with Kaylee is that there, there's a depth and a richness to love that if it's viewed as this exploration and you're sort of in it together and you're doing the work together, that it can get so rich and mm -hmm. so deep. And the reason I say that is, you know, when, when we first met, we were actually high school sweethearts and then we got back together seven years later. I mean, I, I felt from the beginning, like there was this powerful connection, like we were somehow soulmates mm. and it felt like, wow, that's the, the richest, deepest thing I've ever felt. But now 25 years later, after we started dating, it feels like it's a hundred X deeper. Yeah. And I think to myself in 10 or 20 years, I bet it's going to be a hundred X deeper than it is now. Mm -hmm. And so like, I just want to like put that out there as, as that is that's on the menu. That's a, that's a possibility here that you can just continue to explore together and go deeper. And that it's like this infinite well, you know, yeah. and yeah. So, and again, I don't, do I understand how that all works? Not at all. I mean, that's like way beyond science, <laughs> but, but I think it's a, it's something that's there and it's really interesting to explore if you're interested in that. it. And what I heard in that, I don't know if you would agree with this is like soulmates can be built. It's like, you just keep building yeah. that level of connection. And it's not that you just either have it or you don't, you can really add on and continue to explore what that even means. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. 
So thank you so much. Where can people connect more with you and learn more about the 8080 marriage or anything else that you're doing? Yeah, I think the best place is our website, 8080marriage.com. We have a weekly newsletter that goes out with like tips and different tools that people can use. Um, and then also on Instagram, we're there on 8080 marriage. And then I'm doing a bunch of mindfulness stuff. Now I have a new book coming out called open. Mm. We've been talking about openness. Well, that that's the new book actually open. And so I'm exploring that on my own Instagram account at Nate Klemp, Nate Very underscore cool. Klemp. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nate, for being here. I learned a lot and I think it was I know it's going to be a very helpful conversation for our listeners. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me, Sarah. All right.